Fortunes are being accumulated in the UK on a scale we haven't seen for a hundred years. We've been told that the way the super-rich create wealth makes all of us, well, a bit better off. But does it? This time around, they've used new and different financial techniques to enrich themselves. And right now, they're the big winners, and we seem to be the losers. I'm going to tell you how the new super-rich are making their fortunes and why we're picking up the bill in a global greed game. In the past few years, the City of London, financial services, have contributed a third of all our economic growth. London is the capital of capital. London for the international community is a beautiful city. A lot of people are living in London that they might find interesting to meet. It's got the restaurants, it's got the clubs, it's got the bars. It's got the decent hotels, it's got the nice houses. It's safe, it's secure. There's a lot going for it. More than 50 billionaires call Britain home. Not since the 19th century have there been such opportunities for so many to make quite so much money. At least 30,000 Brits now earn more than half a million pounds a year. In 2006, 4,200 city executives took a bonus of a million or more. And among hedge funds alone, 150 people have been earning more than £20 million a year. The only other period we have seen similar accumulation was during the Industrial Revolution in the Victorian age when the whole raft of Victorian industrialists uh, made massive fortunes very quickly. But even that was over a period of 40 or 50 years. This has been in the last 10 years. When you're coming here with several billion pounds, you travel around in armoured limos guarded by people who look after you. The idea of the congestion charge is wonderful to you because it clears the roads of the riffraff. You can get out to a private airfield quickly to get on your jet to go and see far-flung operations as part of your empire. And they've created ghettos of fabulously expensive property. This house in North London recently sold for £50 million. The new owner will be spending probably another up to £30 million creating what will probably be the most desirable house in the world. And just outside London is this brand new 26 bedroom mansion. It's on the market now for over £70 million, but it's the running costs of over a million a year that means only proper billionaires need bother to view it. Even so, the developer, Leslie Allen Verco, tried his best with me. So this is a private swimming pool, is it simply for the owner of the house? Unless, of course, the owner of the house wants to allow people to use it. The ensuite swimming pool. Why would you want five pools? Because you've got five pools, haven't you, in this house? What family needs five pools? You genuinely need to like swimming. This bathroom area is about 800 square feet. Putting it into perspective is about the size of the average two-bedroom flat in London. That's just for your towels, that room, is it? I feel rather disappointed I haven't got one of those. It's the size of a decent-sized kitchen for many it people. <laughs> Jewel-encrusted gold tans. That's very good, very nice. Oh, Definitely going to have to have one of these in my home. So how have all these people become super rich in such a short time? Unlike the past, it's not been about finding new resources or exploiting new technology. The answer lies in how they've conjured with money itself. 
and they were helped to become wealthy beyond anyone's wildest dreams by a sharp fall in the cost of money for them and all of us, engineered by the US Federal Reserve. It sets interest rates for America and, in a way, for the world. A clear September day. The American economy was already faltering after the bursting of the dot-com bubble, and then... The world's most powerful central banker, Alan Greenspan, feared the terrorist outrage would further undermine the confidence of businesses and consumers, so he kept interest rates unusually low. American interest rates were tonight cut by a half of 1%. The Federal Reserve's base rate now stands at just one and a quarter percent, the lowest for 41 years. After the bursting of the dot-com bubble and 9-11, Greenspan slashed rates to just 1%. And the supply of credit soared because the great exporting nations, such as Japan, China and those of the Middle East, were generating vast surpluses and lent much of their cash to us in the West. Finance is global, so it became cheap to borrow money anywhere. For private individuals, and especially for businesses, tycoons and financial institutions. They went on the most frenetic borrowing spree the world has seen. With so much money sloshing around, the price of assets, from paintings to houses to entire companies, soared. So People borrowed more against the inflated value of their assets. The valuation of property, the valuation of shares, art, jewellery, etc., was soaring. And the central banks on the whole said, this is not our business. We don't manage assets. We only manage price inflation. With markets rising, borrowing vast sums for investment was the route to magnificent fortunes. It's what bankers call using leverage. Leverage is simply borrowing to invest. You're not investing your own money. Uh, or you're investing part of your own money, but you borrow to invest more. Um, so that's simply, that's, leverage is borrowing to invest. When we borrow for a mortgage, we're leveraging. As simple as that. The power of leverage to multiply profits is a common experience for millions of us who borrow to buy a house. If you put down a £10,000 deposit, when buying a £100,000 home and borrow the other £90,000 and that house then rises in value to say £110,000, well, your £10,000 doubles to £20,000. You make 100% profit. That's the magic of using the bank's money to finance most of the purchase. And in a rising market, the more you borrow, the greater your profits. The level of debt that became available for deals became very, very high. And what was really uncomfortable was that not only was it a high level of debt, but every passing month you could get more and more debt. With debt so cheap, deal makers were borrowing mind-boggling amounts to invest in financial markets, in property and in commodities, or to buy entire companies. Banks were willing to lend on multiples that they'd never known before. The past five, six years have been unprecedented in terms of cheap debt, quite frankly. And have we benefited, benefited from that? Absolutely. You know, I would rather be lucky than clever every time. Um, so we'll take every bit of luck that's going our way. And for Tom Hunter, Britain was a pretty good place to be. Because since 1997, Labour has tried to make the United Kingdom a land fit for the new super rich. Well, I think, first of all, you've got, you've got to thank your lucky stars if you are an economy which has the vibrant and successful industries to a disproportionate degree. Because, you know, that is generating wealth that you can do something with. So it's better to have the wealth generated that you can do something with than not have the wealth generated at all. 
There was a time, however, when our Prime Minister was explicitly hostile to the idea that tax rules should favour the super-rich. The Chancellor and the Labour Treasury will not permit tax reliefs to millionaires in offshore havens. We will end a situation where millionaires can pay no tax. But in government, Gordon Brown changed his mind. Labour feared that the super-rich would flee Britain if they had to pay the same rate of tax as the rest of us. And if enabling them to stay meant a widening in the gap between the super-rich and the rest of us, well, Gordon Brown believed that was a price worth paying for the benefits that might accrue. We want the best people in the world to come here because the spin-off and the clusters and the multiplier effect of them building businesses within our country is phenomenal. And why not have the best in the world right here? We've had the extreme case, there are um, people in my industry who have literally lived in the country more than 40 years and claim to be non-domiciled and pay very little tax. Now that seems to me, both politically and e indeed at some danger of the word morally, uh, fairly repugnant. Even some of the super-rich began to question whether it's fair that they should be taxed at lower rates than their servants. There's lots of things about my industry I don't like, quite frankly. But I think that, broadly speaking, and I'm speaking personally now, not for my industry, the concept that hedge fund managers pay a lower tax rate on earned income than, uh, you know, maids that clean their office, I think is just palpably absurd. By the start of the 21st century, these two factors, the power of leverage and low taxes for enterprise, gave birth to a new set of business superpowers. Among them are the private equity firms who borrow huge sums of money to buy whole companies. Private equity has demonstrated that if you go into uh, situations uh, in the company sector with uh, clarity of purpose, uh, strong drive, determination, a readiness to pay people incentives to do the difficult things, you can make big returns. And again, you make big returns, particularly when there's lots of cheap money around the place. And the fact that their, their success was over-amplified and magnified by the uh, macroeconomic environment they were operating in, which uh, made them very lucky, uh, and, and uh, I suspect made some of the rest of us rather jealous. Some of Britain's best-known businesses have been taken over and sold on by private equity for billions in profits. They include the AA, Saga, Homebase and Travelodge. The technique used by private equity of buying companies with borrowed money is also employed by Philip Green. He owns much of the British High Street. I think we probably own about 12. Dorothy Perkins, Topshop, Burton, Wallace, Topman, BHS. That's a nice, nice piece of real estate, isn't it? We actually own that. It's probably worth in excess of 200 million. Sir Philip and his family pocketed a 1.2 billion pound dividend in 2005, the equivalent of the pay of 54,000 British workers on average earnings. And there was no tax to pay on it here because it was received by his tax exile wife, Lady Green had an extraordinary period of economic growth and confidence. This, this is the, the critical factor, sentiment. Confidence was very high. The masters of the universe seemed to be getting it right. They had been producing extraordinarily high profits, great returns from their private equity funds. It hasn't just been private equity making billions out of borrowed money. Hedge funds have become the largest dealers in shares and securities across the globe. They make their money by betting on price variations, however small, between what they can buy and how much they can sell for. And they too use borrowed money and leverage to generate spectacular profits. Private equity will take control of a company. Hedge funds will trade a company. It's a very different, they'll trade the shares of a company. So it's a very, it is a very different uh, beast. And how much do you have under management in total? We've got about $10 billion. Hedge funds are enormously powerful now in the financial system. There's a lot of them. 
Uh, they manage a great deal of money. Um, they're not regulated by and large. They're uh, usually in offshore jurisdictions where they are not regulated. I would uh, say that the top three trading institutions in the US Treasury market, which is the largest securities market in the world, are in fact hedge funds. They're not banks. The only serious risk for a hedge fund is that if it consistently loses money, the backers will take their funds back. You can lose money. You're allowed to make a mistake once. But if it's a bad one, you're, you, you're gone. I mean, it's a very fragile. I mean, you're, there is high return in that industry, yes, but uh, you could also very quickly lose the appetite for risk that clients have in you or the interest of clients. So, no, it's very, it's very severe. Very, you, nothing is taken for granted because you are the ultimate risk taker. And you here... Uh, manage how much money now? Now we have uh, around 4.2 billion dollars. Using funds from wealthy investors and huge amounts of borrowed cash, colossal fortunes have been accumulated by hedge fund managers. In 2006, an estimated 10 of them earned more than $500 million each, and five are thought to have trousered more than $900 million in that single year. They included George Soros, a consistent winner who famously made a killing when he sold the pound on a colossal scale and helped to force sterling out of the European exchange rate mechanism in 1992. The average person did not get much benefit from the boom, the super boom, in the last 20 years. Uh, the, it's really the uh, people like me uh, who have really uh, earned enormous amounts of, of money. Very soon we'll know it's been When they arrive at the early game the spirit of an age can be captured in its art. So perhaps this is the symbol of all that debt-fueled financial excess. Damien Hurst's For the Love of God. The glittering death's head, encrusted with 8,601 diamonds, is said to have been sold to an investment consortium for 50 million pounds. But the details of its sale are shrouded in secrecy, as are so many of the transactions of the new super-rich. What's its intrinsic value? There's quite an argument about that. Who actually owns it? No one seems quite sure. In many ways, the glitter and the ambiguity seems to capture perfectly the spirit of this age of easy money. One reason why so much cash was pouring into the pockets of the stars of the new financial industries was the pay structure they devised. They wrote the rules of the greed game so they couldn't lose, though it turned out that most of us could. The money-making skills of private equity and hedge fund stars were considered so rare and precious that they were able to charge their backers astonishing fees. These new breed of fund managers were performing extremely well for their clients. So if you gave them a billion pounds, and if they turned it into two billion pounds, that's a billion pound profit, they'd take 20% of that as a success fee. The tradition had been to take half a percent a year of the backer's money for managing it. But private equity and hedge funds charge much more. A basic fee of 2% a year on all funds under management, plus 20% of all profits. This was jackpot capitalism. So long as that remuneration structure persists, so it's, a, it's an asymmetric bet, it's a one-way bet. If he makes a great deal of money, then uh, he gets his 20% plus of it, um, and if he loses money, well, it wasn't his. Uh, and I think once you've got that, and that leads to earnings in some cases of literally hundreds of millions of dollars in the hands of individuals, they're unlikely to change. If you'd got a deal that you did for a billion, sold for a billion and a half, made half a billion, you'd get a 20% carried interest on that, 100 million. 
you'd probably have taken 30 or 40 million out of it in fees. The reason private equity charges what are considered to be high levels of fees is there are relatively few people in the private equity world and the relatively few new entrants into that world. It's quite a rare combination of, of skills and the results, the financial results that uh, the industry is able to deliver to its investors means that the investors are continuing to pay those fees. Not only were the rewards massive, but the bet was one way. Using borrowed money meant taking 20% of the gains, but leaving all the losses for the original investor. And what began to motivate many wasn't pretty. Do you think greed got the better of some people in that period? Well, I don't know that it was greed. I think it might have been enthusiasm. Uh, and uh, I think in every cycle, it always works the same. People who are doing something keep doing more and more uh, of it. They lose uh, uh, a little of, of their grounding uh, in terms of the amount of risk uh, that they're taking. Because the rewards on offer from hedge funds and private equity firms were so huge, the big banks saw much of their talent defect to them. So the banks too had to offer their more financially creative employees the opportunity to pocket around 20% of the gains. Individual bankers now had the opportunity to play the greed game with their organization's money. It's particularly awe-inspiring when you get back to this central point that the the main things which have driven people's ability to earn that remuneration, not every single case, but the majority of cases have been two things. A bull market and access to the bank's capital. It's not their own money they're risking. What's the sort of minimum, do you think, in the last two or three years that a fairly mediocre, middle-ranking trader or investment banker at one of the bigger houses would have expected to take home? Uh, you're probably talking about a million-dollar bonus in those circumstances. And how high does it go? Um, there isn't any limit. And as the greed game intensified, other professionals joined in. They were eager to facilitate the deals which would reward them rather than ask awkward questions about all that debt that was being heaped on the system. Everybody else joined in. The investment banks who are selling companies uh, the accountants who were increasingly doing less and less work uh, to make deals happen quicker and easier. The lawyers who were finding their ways through difficulties uh, by pretending they weren't there. Everybody contributed. It was a big bubble. And people made a lot of money out of doing as many deals and as big a deal as quickly as they could. If you were a Wall Street investment banker making three million dollars a year you were on top of the world. You were the master of the universe. Suddenly, that banker making $3 million is looking at the hedge fund guy who he used to work with making $3 billion or maybe $1 billion a year. So it's created this big class warfare and envy between what I call the haves and the have mores. Many of the have mores feel a visceral desire to prove their superiority over the mere haves. So there's quite an industry catering to their needs for those little extras. Meet Charlie, who provides what they want, however eccentric. Do people typically use you for stuff they want for themselves or as a present? Oh, it varies. One of the members for his little son asked for one of the premiership footballers to play with his son in his back garden. Which you were able to arrange that? You were able to arrange that. A specific that. premiership footballer? Yes. And you were able to arrange that? we were able to arrange that. It's beautiful. Are you looking more for brown or black? There's no price on it, which is plainly the sign of a good bag. What are you thinking of? That's eight and a half thousand pounds. I would have thought on my BBC salary that's more than affordable. We now have requests of submarines. No, really? Yeah, so they have their own submarines made. You can speak to someone and create your own submarine, which is uh, definitely unique and different. Yeah, unique and different. I, I think I'd probably find myself feeling a bit claustrophobic. Definitely. In there, you? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't someday, could you? One of our members called last week um, asking for a, a jet fighter for her garden. Well, she wanted a jet fighter um, just, just in her garden, in her as, garden. As, as an ornament? Yes, that's what she wanted. <laughs> uh, why? I don't know why. We don't ask. We just say, of course, madam. 
we have to come up with more and more extraordinary experiences, whether it be living with a tribe in the Sahara for six weeks to challenge yourself and your mental state um, through to, uh, you know, climbing, climbing Everest. We have a Valentine's Day extreme event where you can have supper with your wife or your husband on an iceberg up in the Arctic. To walk onto boats that are, uh, and boats probably isn't a great description of them, vessels, that are larger than most homes that I've been into, that are 200 feet long, that can only go into limited ports because only so many ports can handle them, but to walk into staterooms that frankly you would think you were in the Palace of Versailles or Buckingham Palace or the White House, it is pretty amazing and every time I walk onto one of these, these boats and have the opportunity to tour them, it continues to take my breath away. With such a boom in full swing by 2006, it looked like nothing could stand in the way of the players in the greed game. And yet the very methods they used to make all that money contained flaws that would topple them, derail the world's biggest economy, and cause mayhem for the banks on which we all depend. Low interest rates didn't just make it cheap to borrow, they gave little incentive to save. And this had significant consequences for the banks, which needed to raise money to meet the inexhaustible appetite for loans. The first thing is that we had a significant decline in savings rates, so the deposits uh, fell. The banks could not necessarily provide all the funding for the products they, they, they got demand for simply from deposits. Um, so they had to look for other forms of funding. And one of the forms of funding was to repackage some of the assets they have, sell them onto the market, get cash for that because they're transferring the assets away. And in this way, they have now more cash and they can start lending again. So in America, Wall Street banks started by selling good quality loans to raise money and then looked at what else could be sold. There was this machine that Wall Street created which was really remarkable. And they kept on pressing this technology to the point where um, they said, well, prime mortgages work. How about we expand this technology to include less credit worthy home buyers? With no income verification, no bank statements, and no tax returns needed. And with this no documentation loan, Greenlight Financial Services gives you the choice. Individuals, often those with the worst of credit histories, were given the opportunity to borrow to own that cherished home. They were known as subprime borrowers, and there were truly frantic attempts to lend to them. The ads would be, you know, literally, you know, just released from prison, never had a job, can't document that you, you know, are even a citizen. Please come down. We would like to make a mortgage for you. In Cleveland, Ohio, the mortgage brokers wouldn't let any opportunity to earn a commission slip away. They came out to my job. It was a snowy day, and I was told if I wanted the house, I had to sign then there on the spot. So I just signed hurriedly. I was looking for a place for my children and myself, and it was like, either you sign or you don't have a home. So I just signed. The mortgage brokers which supplied subprime loans to the likes of Eleanor Hall didn't keep those loans on their books. The capital for those loans came from banks on Wall Street and after the loans had been made, they were sold by the banks at a profit to investors who might be thousands of miles away in Europe or Asia. The new model says, I make the loan, I package it up, I sell it on to somebody else, it's gone as quickly as possible, and there is no ongoing or continuing involvement or relationship or responsibility on behalf of the lending bank. Every time a mortgage was given, the broker took a commission. Every time those mortgage loans were sold on by the banks that extended the credit, the banks booked a profit. And because the banks had sold the risk of that loan going bad to someone else, there was little proper incentive to impose proper checks that the borrowers really had the means to repay their debts. 
subprime, you go from four times income to eight times income. You go from checking the incomes to not checking the income, from doing proper valuations to using Google Earth and postcodes to value houses, which was done. Um, so everything was driven far too far. Do you own a house? Are you looking for lower mortgage payments? Yeah, who can help me with that? Cal can. There was a torrent of cash for subprime loans thanks to a banking breakthrough called Structured Finance, which turned risky loans into supposedly safe investments. This is how it works. Here are three risky subprime borrowers. And over here are three investors who buy investments created from their mortgages. One investor loves risk, one likes a bit of risk, and another hates taking risks and wouldn't normally lend to a subprime borrower. Now here's the great innovation known as structured finance which persuades the low risk investor who controls billions to lend to our subprime borrowers. I'm a clever banker, well let's pretend, and I'll mix these three mortgage loans together and create three new investment opportunities. To Mr. No Risk, the pension fund manager, I promise that he'll get first dibs on whatever cash is received from these three borrowers. And because he's getting first dibs on the cash, he thinks the money he's investing or lending is as safe as can be. To Mr. Medium Risk, the investment banker, I promise that he'll get the second bite. And the lover of risk who runs a hedge fund, she'll get whatever's left over. In the unlikely event all my borrowers pay on time, the three investors all do very nicely. If one borrower gets into difficulties, well, we sort of assumed that would happen, and my investors are still pretty happy. But if none of them pay, then they're all facing losses and are pretty upset, especially Mr. No Risk. Many hundreds of billions of dollars of low-quality subprime loans were transformed in this way into investments that were labelled as good quality. And they were sold to investors all over the world. It was a worldwide phenomenon. This risk really was taken out of Boston, out of Massachusetts, um, and really spread, almost atomized like a fine mist around the world. And what was the motivation for selling quite so much debt? Basically greed, uh, quite frankly. But by repackaging them into these more exotic vehicles, we could then yet again front load the fees. And I can't stress how important it is, uh, the self-interest being moved forward in this process. The market was booming. So if you go back to 2006, um, you'd probably be talking 1.7, 1.8 trillion of market volume. Uh, not only my bank, but many banks, talking about the overall market, that's a significant amount. Uh, so everything is positive, bullish, uh, there's fire going on. So the overall market gets into a frenzy. Most of the world's big banks, from Citigroup and Merrill Lynch in the US to our own Royal Bank of Scotland and Barclays, were stampeding to make profits by turning risky subprime loans into supposedly high-quality investments. A situation where a guy who's organising bank debt could take home a bonus quite literally 40 times his salary uh, does buy us behaviour. Um, the guys wanted to do deals. Everybody has to get on board or they'll be left behind. They couldn't refuse to play because if they did, they wouldn't have been bankers. The banks would have lost clients and so on. The markets can't help. They have to go to excesses of, of, of uh, euphoria and despair. But the quality of the investments was not what the bankers thought it was, because more of the borrowers defaulted than they expected. You guys ready? Let's, let's, let you go, let's, let's start to get this eviction on the roll here. Sheriff's office! When I 
started, we were getting about 12 evictions a week. Now we're getting 90. Just go to show you that neighbors are, you know, going through the same sort of problems within weeks of each other, literally. Subprime borrowers had been lured into taking on their mortgages by special low teaser rates, with neither borrower nor lender worrying enough about what would happen when the low rates came to an end. And when rates rose, well, for many, default was inevitable. At the end of her introductory offer, Eleanor Hall's monthly payments went up by a painful 75%. I was under the impression that I had a fixed rate of six twenty-five a month. I had no idea that I had a variable rate that would escalate every three to six months. So my mortgage went from six hundred and twenty-five dollars a month to a thousand ninety-eight dollars a month. You could borrow a hundred percent of 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 the debt without any questions asked, and with a teaser rate that would that really got you sucked in. The very word three teaser uh, uh, rate gives the game away. The essence of good banking for millennia, that the lender is supposed to check whether the borrower can actually repay, had been lost. When I grew up and I looked at banking and, uh, and was in banking indeed, what used to happen was you went to see a bank manager to borrow money and he lent you the money and made sure that you paid it back or tried to make sure that you paid it back. As soon as you divorce those two things, you're in trouble. In the stampede to do deals, banking common sense had been abandoned. But for years, the danger was ignored because all those dodgy loans had been converted into investments that had a triple A rating, which in the past had always meant that they were ultra safe. When something is rated in the financial community, triple A, the assumption of everyone is that it just can't go wrong. In all of my years uh, in finance, which is now getting pretty close to 40 years, uh, I've never seen a AAA uh, default. Uh, AAAs don't default. AAAs are like Exxon and Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, there are very few AAAs, uh, and, and they do not default. But just how impartial were the agencies that awarded these AAA ratings? After all, they were paid by the banks which wanted to sell the investments as AAA. None of us would hide the fact that we are paid by the issuers of the bonds. and That does create a potential conflict of interest. Um, what we would point out, though, is that we have a number of ways of managing that conflict to ensure the integrity of the work that we do. But when giving the AAA rating, the agencies didn't actually go back to the subprime borrowers and check that they'd be able to repay their loans. We do not do underlying due diligence. We do rely on information that's given to us. The investor community was aware of that, or should have been aware of that, because it was public fact. Eventually, the simplest and oldest financial logic would reassert itself. The thing people forget about borrowing money is you've got to pay it back. <laughs> That's a golden rule that I learned at my father's apron. And someday the bank's going to come and say, could I have my money back? And then you say, oh well it's in this house, which isn't quite valued what I paid for it and therefore I need to sell it and therefore, you know, it all unhinges. The bankers and rating agencies had been too clever for their own good. They based their AAA ratings on historical data. They looked at how many subprime loans had gone bad when the market was tiny and used that information to calculate how many would default as the market grew and grew and grew. It turned out to be a catastrophic error. The red light was November 06, a bit more than a year ago, when uh, what you call the first pay default, a very important figure, i.e. people who have borrowed and at their first payment, six months after borrowing, are not paying the first interest. That's pretty significant. Uh, first pay default historically was one and a half percent, one to two percent. In a matter of a month, that figure jumped to five, six percent. That was a clear sign when you have people not paying that you should be worried. Default rates were 
bound to rise as subprime loans shot up from being one in every 13 US mortgages in 2001 to one in every four by 2006. I received this notice at the beginning of September. Um, it was plastered to my door. It was bad enough, it broke me down, but I had to do everything to keep my children in control because I really didn't want them to know what was actually being done. Eleanor Hall, like thousands of others, can't pay and has been made homeless. I don't ever see myself owning another home. I just don't see it. I don't trust. I'm always looking over my shoulder. People I thought had my best interest, they was only out for a dollar. Here's what really shocked the bankers. Subprime loans were going bad faster than any other kind of loan, in a wholly unprecedented way. In the past decades, it was always the case that the general population would default on everything else in order to keep their house at default. Credit cards they default on their loan to buy their fridge, they default on, 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 on their um, car loans. And then finally they would default on their mortgage. They're keeping their credit card currents and they're defaulting on their mortgage first. This has never been seen before. When the scale of losses from subprime loans could no longer be ignored, the holders of all those AAA investments made out of subprime loans had a horrible awakening. In August 2007, a big French bank, BNP Paribas, sparked a global financial panic when it announced that it couldn't value its holdings of investments created from subprime loans. When BNP came out with that, you know, this was a moment of saying, it's time to go home, children, the party's over now. Banks became reluctant to lend to each other because they weren't sure which of them were holding the subprime poison and whether they would ever get their money back. The multi-trillion dollar money markets that underpin the global economy seized up. The speed at which it happened, the way in which institutions, financial institutions just you know, withdrew from the market because they were worried, I think that was unprecedented. And it surprised uh, politicians, it surprised regulators, and certainly surprised the banks. So once you're in that vicious circle, lack of confidence, bit of lack of trust, lack of, you know, you don't know who's holding the problem, everybody then, like lemmings, run for cover. Once people got scared, they, they started being less happy to lend to each other, they started being less happy to, to work with each other, and again, uh, that, that in itself led, led to all sorts of other, other, other activities, specifically uh, securities going down in price. Was that, was that fear rational? Is fear ever rational? I don't know, but uh, is, is that fear rational? Uh, I'll give you a short answer, yes. The fact that people did not know the full exposure to the subprime area or, or to the sieb area or whatever, yes, of course, if you don't know something, being fearful is rational. Once the river of money stopped flowing, with banks and financial institutions loath to lend to each other, there was a very high-profile casualty in Britain. One of Britain's biggest mortgage lenders needs emergency support from the Bank of England. Northern Rock has problems raising money because of the crisis in the financial markets. Be absolutely clear, there is no suggestion that this, this business is fundamentally bust, but merely running out of money in this way uh, for a bank is extraordinarily serious. The company was very successful because it was taking a tremendous amount of risk. Northern Rock went to the brink of insolvency because its business was dependent on raising money by selling its mortgages to international investors. And when investors were burned by losses on subprime, they refused to buy any mortgages, Northern Rock's or anyone else's. They were actually possessed of enough capital to survive approximately a one-week shutdown in the capital markets. That was all. Banks across the world, in Germany, France, Switzerland and the US, have lost tens of billions of dollars and have had to be bailed out by governments or by investors with deep pockets. 
The Swiss bank UBS says it suffered much bigger losses than anticipated because of its exposure to the subprime mortgage market in the United States. And today, Barclays said it had written off £1.6 billion of risky investments related to US mortgages. The global credit crisis has deepened, with America's fifth largest investment bank asking for emergency funding. Bear Stearns, which has been hit by the US housing market slump, has been bailed out by another bank and the Federal Reserve. Some of the bankers responsible for the financial losses are losing their jobs. Bonuses of investment bankers are going to fall drastically now that you're discovering that a lot of the banks, investment banks, are taking billions of dollars worth of write-offs and these people are getting kicked out unceremoniously out of their jobs. As for those companies bought by private equity, well, if they took on too much debt, they'll experience difficulties which would be bad news for their investors and employees. There are some clear examples of loans which are looking dreadful now. Some of the leverage buyouts done at Fatface, the retailer, Countrywide, the estate agent. The loans on those companies are being dealt with regularly now at discounts of a quarter or more to their face value. So clearly there are some bad loans out there. But many of the super-rich who helped create this unsustainable boom are sitting pretty. There are a lot of people who have made enormous amounts of money, created great mayhem, and I'm afraid they're not going to get hurt greatly by what's happening now. Um, there is, uh, I understand at the moment, for example, quite a shortage of high-end uh, hotel rooms in the Caribbean, uh, um, Mauritius and similar places because um, these people have got nothing to do at the moment and lots of money. Having trousered so much, the super rich apparently have a problem many of us would love. Very top end people are very liquid, have made a lot of money in the, the last 10 years. In fact, probably find it quite difficult to spend the money they've earned. Um, and, and that's why companies like us, I think, are very successful, because we help them spend their money. Frankly, for companies that are producing such limited quantities of these very exclusive products, they can't manufacture them quickly enough. There's a new Rolls-Royce, the Drophead Coupe, that was launched last year. If you were to walk into your Rolls-Royce dealer today, if you were lucky, you would maybe get one in two years. They continue to indulge um, in their passions, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. And demand for the most expensive motoring experience on Earth doesn't seem to have evaporated. The car is not only the most expensive and fastest car on the planet, but it's also one of the most usable cars. The customer who pays 1.1 million euros plus tax gets a car which is really second to none. The British have been uh, the best European market, and they still are the best European market. They are only the second to the US. Um, our best dealership in the world, our single dealership in the world, is Jack Barclay in London. So for the super lux industry, price cutting isn't on the agenda. The one million dollar watch cannot be affected by no price. That's the extreme. The extreme is safe. At the one billion, there will always, always, always be demand for one billion dollar watch. That is for sure. And if you want to build a new watch brand and you want to go safe, start with one million. <laughs> Your first price. <laughs> then you are safe.
the reason the super rich can feel safe is that the gambles they've taken with other people's money have been so huge that the authorities have to bail them out, or else the damage to the rest of us could be crippling. These people who operate in the financial markets, they're smart. They know that they are too big to fail. They know that the authorities will ride to their rescue. And so everywhere along the line, there are one-way bets. And this means that you are incentivized to take big risks. You're greedy. The bigger the risk you take, the bigger the profit for yourself. And if things go badly, oops, not our problem, your problem. You pick up the mess. It's a mess they've landed all of us in. The losses incurred by banks, hedge funds, insurers and other financial businesses, which could reach $3 trillion, have reduced their willingness to lend to any of us and badly damaged the global financial system. It's as though the mechanism for injecting fuel into the economy has broken down. And when that happens, we all suffer. I think it's a mistake for people to think these events don't apply to them. Um, that you know, they don't own any subprime mortgages or collateralized debt obligations or even equities. So what does it matter to them? Um, it affects us all. Uh, and the, the, the credit creation process is at the heart of everything uh, in our economy. And uh, without that, you cannot get normal functioning. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the damage that's been done to that is large and it's persistent. So when you talk about the average home, uh, owner in, uh, and worker in, the, uh, in its impact on them, they probably will find that their mortgage costs more. Um, whatever the absolute level of interest rates, if they're unlucky, they may find that their job's affected by this as well. I think there are some, some very severe real-world effects on people's ability to, uh, to borrow. Our banks have less money to lend to us, and they're charging more for what they will lend. That's leading to falls in house and property prices, which makes us feel poorer and it risks creating a vicious downward spiral as we spend less and the economy slows down. Just to translate that into um, what it means for ordinary people, um, if people are borrowing less, saving more, that'll translate into slow growth. Does it, does it translate into a serious recession in your view? I don't expect a worldwide uh, recession. I, I do expect a recession in the United States, the severity of which cannot be predicted. As a result of recent budget changes, the British tax system may no longer be quite so favourable to the new super-rich as it was. But what about the widening income and wealth gap between the super-rich and the rest of us? It's more the way that wealth's accumulated. If wealth's accumulated out of people growing companies successfully, that's you know, it's generally good. It's hard to come up with a real negative on that. If, on the other hand, it's some guy who's made all of his money out of making two or three huge financial bets, then the social implications are much wider because those bets will go wrong as well as right. And when they go wrong, there will be a lot of victims other than the guy. So there's a social and political issue there. So the guy who's made a hundred million out of um, being the promoter of over-leveraged structures, um, that's a political issue. He's caused a lot of damage and he's got very rich. I think it, uh, an economy which is characterized by extremes of wealth is not a secure and safe economy any more than one economy versus another economy. Extremes of wealth and income give rise, I think, to very serious moral risks. That might not matter if we could be confident that lessons are being learned from the crisis. But what we see is that America's central bank, the Federal Reserve, is once again slashing interest rates and pumping cash into the system. Now, didn't that start the whole poisonous process? You have a boom-bust process similar to many that we have had in the last uh, uh, decades. But it's also the end of a super boom that has lasted since the end of the Second World War. From time to time, the markets don't correct themselves, you have a crisis. And then the authorities have to intervene and inject liquidity 
and bail out the failing institutions. And that creates an, a system of asymmetric uh, uh, incentives where you are encouraged to leverage, but uh, if, if things really go wrong, uh, uh, there is relief. If those in charge of the system can't be relied upon to change their ways, what chance that those who play the greed game might actually mend theirs? They've been incentivized to take dangerous risks with other people's money in the hunt for big profits and vast rewards. Have those incentives been eliminated? No, not really. I think that um, if you set up a, a basic remuneration structure where people get paid 20% of the gains from playing with other people's money, um, I'm not quite sure what possible event could occur to make them learn anything from it. Um, you really just need to change the structure. That's the only thing that will get their attention. And who's going to change that structure? There's only really one group of people who ever can, can change any structure like that, and I think that's the owners. Uh, this is a matter of uh, so long as people are willing to be shareholders in banks where traders are allowed to play with the bank's capital uh, and walk off with 20, 20 or 30% of the, of the gains on it and none of the losses, um, and where people are willing to invest in private equity and hedge funds and allow the same thing to occur, it will occur. If you're a hedge fund or a private equity firm, there are fantastic opportunities to profit from the turmoil. A number of hedge funds have already made billions from betting that all those subprime investments were overvalued. And some have done very nicely from speculating that the share prices of our leading banks would tumble. As for private equity, well, a recession would be just the most glorious time to buy businesses at knockdown prices. Is this actually a period of tremendous opportunity for a firm like you? Yes, it's, it's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a great opportunity. The, the, the real golden age comes when you have a mess. Uh, you have economies that are on their back, uh, uh, you know, uh, capital uh, 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 inadequate. Uh, and, and when you start buying businesses at that part in the cycle, uh, you inevitably do uh, extremely well unless you're too early. Uh, and and uh, right now it's a little bit too early, uh, but, but as you wait uh, and this develops, uh, it'll be a great time uh, to be buying businesses. So there are still plenty of opportunities for the new super rich to increase their fortunes. Even though the global financial system is in intensive care and our prosperity is threatened. With the greed game still being played, if we're not going to end up the losers again, the rules will need to be rewritten.